I'd like to reconvene the September 30th, 2011 meeting of the Newport Beach City Council. May we have the roll call, please? The record will reflect that all members of council are present. And do we have a closed session report? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Yes, we do. In regards to closed session item 4A3, which is entitled Morn versus City of Newport Beach, the case number reflected on the agenda is wrong. The correct case number should be 30-2011-0044704. As far as reportable items, uh, in regards to closed session item 4A4, entitled Morningside versus City of Newport Beach, the City Council voted unanimously to authorize the City Attorney's Office to defend this red action which seeks to set aside the City Council's decision to terminate, terminate the zoning agreement with Morningside. In regards to closed session item 4B1, the, the City Council voted unanimously to authorize the City's uh, Attorney's Office to file civil action against Morningside Recovery LLC and the owners of the properties uh, reflected on the agenda to abate the residential care facilities at these locations. But that's all to that for tonight. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, would we uh, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance led by Councilmember Rosansky and stay standing for the invocation by the Reverend Peter D. Haynes of the St. Michael and All Angels Episcopal Church. Be prayerful. Wondrous God, fountain of life and source of goodness, you have made all that is and given us all that we have. We are grateful and thank you for the people of this beautiful place and for able, responsible leaders in the mutual regard which forms our civic life. Give us, we pray, your spirit of peace, justice, charity, wisdom, humor, and grace. That we, that we may find with one another the fulfillment of our humanity here in this lovely city. For you are gracious, great lover of souls, and to you we give glory and honor, now and forever. Amen. Thank you. We have one presentation this evening um, by the uh, accident of the calendar. Uh, we did not have a um, city council meeting opportune to noting and memorializing our city's view and concern and deepest empathy with regard to the events of September 11th, 2001 and the 10th anniversary of that horrific event. And so we do want to uh, note that this evening. I have a proclamation uh, to read and then I'm going to ask for a moment of silence in reverence to those who um, sacrificed, in some cases, everything, and in many other cases, so much for our freedom and the benefit of our great country. So the proclamation is as follows. The city of Newport Beach joining the national moment of remembrance for the 10th anniversary of September the 11th. Whereas the city of Newport Beach expresses its support of the United States Senate regarding coming together as a nation and ceasing all work or other activity for a moment of remembrance beginning at 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on September the 11th in honor of the 10th anniversary of the terrorist attacks committed against the United States on that date. And whereas at 8.46 a.m. on September 11th, 2001, hijacked American Airlines Flight 11 crashed into the upper portion of the North Tower of the World Trade Center in New York City. And whereas 17 minutes later at 9.03 a.m. hijacked United Airlines Flight 175 crashed into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. And whereas at 9.37 a.m. the west wall of the Pentagon was hit by hijacked American Airlines Flight 77, the impact of which caused immediate and catastrophic damage to the headquarters of the Department of Defense. And whereas at approximately 10 a.m. the passengers and crew of hijacked United Airlines Flight 93 acted heroically to retake control of the airplane and thwart the taking of additional American lives by crashing the airliner in Shanksville, Pennsylvania 
and in doing so gave their lives to save countless others. And whereas nearly 3,000 innocent civilians were killed in the heinous attacks of September the 11th, and whereas 10 years later, thousands of men and women in the United States Armed Forces remain in harm's way defending the United States against those who seek to threaten the United States. And whereas the lives of Americans were changed forever on September the 11th, 2001, when the events threatened the American way of life, and whereas in 2009, Congress and the President joined together to designate September 11th as a National Day of Service and Remembrance under the Serve America Act, and whereas September the 11th will never and should never be just another day in the hearts and minds of all people of the United States. Now therefore be it resolved that the city of Newport Beach recognizes September 11th, 2011 as a day of solemn commemoration of the events of September 11th, 2001 and a day to come together as a nation and offer its deepest and most sincere condolences to the families and friends and loved ones of the innocent victims of September 11th, 2001 terrorist attacks and honor the heroic service actions and sacrifices of first responders, law enforcement personnel, state and local officials, volunteers, and countless others who aided the innocent victims of those attacks and in doing so bravely risked and often gave their own lives. And in witness hereof, I have hereunto set on my hand and cause the seal of the city of Newport Beach to be affixed this 13th day of September, 2011. May we please have a moment of silence in remembrance. Thank you. May God bless America. Okay. With that, the notice to the public. The city provides a yellow sign-in card to assist in the preparation of the minutes. The completion of the card is not required in order to address the council. Speakers must limit comments to five minutes on agenda items. The council has a discretion to extend or shorten the time limit on agenda or non-agenda items. As a courtesy, please turn cell phones off or set them in the silent mode. Now is the time for council announcements or matters which council members would like placed on a future agenda for discussion, action, or report. Thank you, Leilani. I'm going to change things up just a little bit and uh, start off myself with announcements by announcing that we have a new city attorney who is here tonight in his first city council member or meeting in that capacity, although certainly not new to the city of Newport Beach. We are thrilled that we have been able to retain Aaron Harp to join Newport Beach as our new city attorney. Aaron was an assistant city attorney here in Newport Beach and had a fine career uh, before going to Anaheim where he further extended his career and uh, uh, extended his capabilities and accomplishments in a way that made him uh, an excellent and in fact the best candidate for the city of Newport Beach to hire as city attorney. And so um, on behalf of the city council and all the citizens of Newport Beach, Aaron, uh, re-welcome aboard. We're glad to have you and look forward to working with you. Would you care to make some comments? Well, thank, thank you very much, Mayor Hen and council members. Uh, I've always really enjoyed working with the city of Newport Beach. It's such a wonderful community, and I do truly appreciate uh, you giving me the opportunity to come back and work with you again and work with the city staff here and the citizens of the city of Newport Beach. So thank you very much. Very good. Well, I think a round of applause is appropriate. So. All right. Now you're officially in the hot seat. Next to Dave. <coughs> Okay, very good. Council announcements. Council Member Daigle. Uh, yes, uh, this Saturday at uh, University of California, Irvine, at the Bren Center, they're having a summit uh, on autism. It's called the KEDA uh, Summit. And an individual that lives in our community, Dr. Fairboys Massey, uh, spearheaded uh, the summit. And Fairboys was telling me their, their target was to get 200 attendees. They have more than 700 um, attendees coming to this summit. And it really speaks to... Uh, 
uh, autism is crossing all boundaries, uh, where you live, your educational uh, level, your ethnicity, uh, whatever it is, these people have come together. And I went last year, and my impression was they really came together for information and for support. And uh, autism is something that is in increasing in frequency. You know, maybe it's just diagnosed more, but there's certainly more cases that are occurring. And it's a highly credible uh, forum. They had many uh, medical experts, and I was quite impressed with uh, with the manner by which our medical community is really searching for uh, treatments and, and really um, trying to take this uh, head on to help all the families. Um, and this year's keynote uh, speaker is uh, First Lady Rosalind Carter. Um, so it's great to have the First Lady here. And I also wanted to thank the mayor. I'd asked him to do a proclamation for the event. And uh, they wanted to pass on that they're, that they're very proud of this proclamation. They're going to be displaying it uh, in the front lobby. So they're very appreciative of the City of Newport Beach's support. So thank you. Very good. Council Member Curry. No items. And Council Member Selich. I have no announcements. Council Member Hill. Yes, I have one. Uh, Airfare, one of our citizen groups that have dedicated themselves for many years uh, for the extension of the settlement agreement that protects us uh, uh, from the uh, activities at John Wayne Airport, is having a fundraiser Thursday evening. Uh, from 5 to 7 at the uh, Newport Beach Vineyards and Winery on Mesa Drive, one of our three wineries I think we have now in the city. And it's, um, um, I've heard rumor that uh, Supervisor Morlock will be uh, there as well uh, to meet and greet, and I would encourage anybody that uh, is interested. It's uh, $75 a person or $125 a couple. And once again, this Thursday uh, at the uh, Newport Beach Winery, 5 to 7, airfare fundraiser. Very good. Council Member Rosansky. None, thank you. And Mayor Pro Tem Gardner. Well, one wants to be au courant, so I just would like to announce I did my first flash mob last week. <laughs> <laughs> Were you on time? Yes, I was. Not like the commercial. <laughs> I, <laughs> I got the message. Um, a little more seriously, though. Uh, Huntington Beach recently had a lawsuit a claim for $500,000 for a child who was severely burned because of a fire ring accident. And I brought something up a couple of years ago, and uh, it proved to be <laughs> an inflammatory issue. Um, yeah, I know. Uh -huh. uh, and we had more important things on our, our menu right then. We were dealing with our first budget issues and everything, so I went away. But I think with, with this, I would ask uh, the council to support sending this to our Parks, Beaches, and Recreation Commission to look at. Um, and before I get all sorts of angry emails, particularly from the woman in Florida, I thought that was interesting about this, um, I'm making no recommendations. I'm simply saying there's a spectrum. There's, we can go everywhere from doing what we do now to no fire pits, but there's a big range in between as well. And I think that our commission is well positioned to, to give us some direction on that. So I would, if everybody's in agreement, I would like them to put that on their agenda. All right, I'm sure you'll get a thank you note from Parks, Beaches, and Recreation from that. Any other announcements? Okay, I have a few announcements. Uh, tomorrow, uh, we're going to have a group homes conference. This is our first conference in, how long ago, Steve? Four year, three years ago? Three or four years ago, we held a conference on the issue of group uh, alcohol and drug rehabilitation homes here in the city. And of course, we've had a lot of water under the bridge since then on this issue, and, uh, and the stream is still f flowing quite strongly. Um, but we think it's a good time to kind of reconvene, uh, think about where the world has gone over the last several years on this issue, solicit views from our residents and from operators, anybody that wants to provide input uh, to the city um, about how we might uh, move forward here uh, from where we are today. And so I think it uh, looks like we're going to get good attendance. Uh, the conference uh, begins at 1.30 p.m. tomorrow afternoon. It's in the Newport uh, Coast Community Center. We certainly invite anyone who has and a, uh, an interest in this subject to attend. And then uh, the Neighborhood Revitalization Committee uh, meets uh, on uh, September the 15th at 4 p.m. in Council Chambers. 
On September the 17th, that's a Saturday at 9 a.m., I have a Meet the Mayor uh, arrangement, the first one after a little bit of a summer hiatus. That's going to be at the fire station number seven in Santa Ana Heights. That's at 9 a.m. on Saturday. And then the, there are two citizens advisory panels that I chair that will be meeting. This is on revitalization efforts. One is Santa Ana Heights. This is a landscape design project uh, team. This is on, uh, I'm sorry, I don't chair these committees. I am the council liaison to these committees. Uh, that Santa Ana Heights committee meets on September the 21st at the Santa Ana Heights fire station. And uh, Kim, I have that for two o'clock. I know the last one was at 3.15, but this one's at two o'clock uh, on September the 21st. And then that same, uh, excuse me, uh, on September the 22nd at 4 p.m., the Balboa Village Citizens Advisory Panel meets in the Nautical Museum. That'll be a very interesting meeting. We'll have presentations from the Nautical Museum. I should stop calling them that. It's really exploration, exploration, I should say. And from the Balboa Theater, um, as well as a discussion of um, some visioning statements, potential visioning statements for Balboa Village. And so um, look forward to that meeting on the 22nd. The Tidelands Management Committee meets on September the 21st at 4 p.m. In, in the Oasis Center. Um, then Saturday and Sunday, September 24th and 25th, the Fun Zone in Balboa Village separate, celebrates its 75th anniversary. And so I invite all our citizens to come down, have some fun. There'll be some fun things planned. That'll be a nice way to spend a weekend, or at least part of it. Lastly, Taste of Newport is this weekend. So all you foodies out there, this is your big chance. Uh, it's a great event, uh, Saturday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And uh, look forward to seeing as many people out there as we can. OK, that's it for announcements. Um, consent calendar. All, all matters listed under consent calendar, items 1 through 21, are considered by the council to be routine and will all be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. The council members have received detailed staff reports on each of the items recommending an action. There will be no separate discussion of these items prior to the time the council votes on the motion unless members of the council, staff, or the public request specific items to be discussed and are removed from the consent calendar for separate action. Members of the public who wish to discuss a consent calendar item should come forward to the lectern upon invitation by the mayor and state their name and item number. If the optional signing card has been completed, it should be placed in the box provided at the podium. Thank you. Council Member Hill, did you have any items to pull? Uh, I do not, except to note that I will uh, uh, be abstaining on item number 21 as the Balboa Bay Club falls within the 500-foot uh, uh, circle of my residence. And Council Member Rosansky. Uh, none, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Gardner. Number three. And Council Member Daigle. Um, I was going to vote no on three, but you pull it, that's fine. And then I wanted to pull 16. I'm sorry, say that again? I wanted to pull 16. 16, okay. And uh, Council Member Curry? No items to pull, but just to note with item 13, we're contracting out another city service. This is our building facilities custodial services at a savings of $83,000. Council Member Selich? I have none. And I have none. Um, do any members of the public have an item they wish to pull? If so, please step up. Jim Mosher, number 21. Okay. Item number three. Uh, that item has already been pulled. Yes, so you're covered. Uh, hi, Steve Ray, item 11, please. Okay. Anyone else wishing to pull a consent calendar uh, item? I forgot also, I had a correction to the minutes. Um, on page uh, 227 in the second paragraph, it talks about the Bike Safety Committee meeting on the second Monday. It only met on the second Monday on those two holidays. Usually it meets on the first Monday. Okay, do I have a motion? Yes. Um, does the manager have any items to pull? Uh, thank you, Councilmember Dagle. We were going to pull item 16 and recommend that actually that be continued to 927, September 27th, to work on 
that some more, but we'd certainly welcome your comments, um, Ms. Daigle, if you have yeah. additional ones. Or did you want to do that as part of the motion if everyone agrees to If, if you speak. don't mind, yeah, we would yeah. Re recommend that that motion move to continue to 927. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I too had a couple of corrections to the minutes. It's reflected already. Thank you. Yes, I provided those amendments. Uh, move items 1 through 21 with the exception of 3, 11, and 21 with 16 continued and an abstention by Council Member Hill on number 20, 21. Oh, we're not voting on 21. I just Second. Second. Just a question. Is that a recusal or an abstention? It would be an abstention. Uh, are you speaking of 21? I will recuse myself when that is discussed. Well, oh, that's right. It's pulled. Okay, fine, fine. All right. There's a motion, and I seconded it. Uh, please vote. Prior to reading the vote, I have to read the ordinance titles and resolutions for item four, ordinance number 2011-21, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach, approving a zoning code amendment to change the zoning designation of property located at 105 15th Street. Item five, resolution number 2011-87, a resolution of City Council of the City of Newport Beach, approving the transfer agreement for fiscal year 2010 Homeland Security grant program purposes between the City of between the city and the county of Orange and authorizing the police chief, the fire chief, and the city manager to act as the authorized agents to execute on behalf of the city and any actions necessary to implement the transfer agreement and obtain federal financial assistance provided by the Federal Department of Homeland Security and subgranted through the state of Cal California. Item 6, resolution number 2011-88. A resolution of the City Council of City of Newport Beach declaring the city's support of an energy leader partnership between Southern California Edison and the City of Newport Beach. And item 7, resolution number 2011-89, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach prohibiting overnight parking on Back Bay Drive between Jamboree Road and Shellmaker Road. And with that, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Leilani. All right, on to the first item that was pulled, uh, item number three, Mayor Pro Tem Gardner. Uh, is anyone from the Mariner's Point project here? Hmm, well, <laughs> oh, well, just, just a minute, I think what, what I'm going to say is not what you're going to say, so hold on just a second, let me direct staff on something. Um, part of the, our green building guidelines and part of our bike safety is to make things more bike friendly and that we didn't really talk about it last time, although Council Member Daigle did mention that. But I hope that we'll have staff work closely with them to incorporate some bike racks or bike corrals, as well as improving that one area in front of their property so it's not so dangerous for bicycles. Yes. So can we Thank communicate you. that to the yes. developer? Yes, work for the developer. Um, and I appreciate um, the comments by the Mayor Pro Tem. I know there's a meeting with Caltrans. There's 22,000 employees at Caltrans. 11 attended that meeting, and there was absolutely no resolution as to what to do with that curb. So I'm hoping our city, uh, which obviously has a much smaller employee base, is able to make an improvement there that uh, is for the public safety. Perhaps we can do it with less than 22,000 people. <laughs> less is more. Okay, any other uh, comment here from the dais on this item? All right, seeing none, seeing none uh, I'll take public comment. Sir? My name is, <coughs> excuse me, my name is Jack Gearlings. I live at 411 Kings Road, which is uh, above the project as proposed. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen of the council, with regard to the Mariner's Point project, uh, we homeowners above the project believe your vote to proceed with the project is extremely bad decision. You have completely disregarded the unanimous vote of the planning commission against the project. I wonder why you all have a planning commission if you don't even discuss it with them. I talked to one of the members of the planning commission and he said nobody talked to him about it. And they all voted that the project was too big and that something should be done to reduce the size and essence of the project. As you're aware, uh, 
With respect to the size of the project, it, uh, it's very large. It has 50,000 square feet plus in the garage itself and another 20 some odd thousand square feet of commercial space adjacent to it. It all goes on three quarters of an acre. That's an extremely small, irregular piece of ground. And as the ordinance now exists, they seem to be fair uh, with respect to the people up on the hill that live above and also with respect to the people that are building below. And if you go ahead and approve this, which you have indicated you're going to do, uh, it's not going to be just there, but then the next lot over, which is below my house more or less, and on up the street will be big structures of this nature, which I don't think are to the advantage of the city. Also, it creates a, a considerable traffic problem where the garage is going to be. There's two entrances, as you are aware. Plus, there's an entrance right adjacent. So there's three entrances right there, very close, where three lanes merge into two. And I think that's going to be a real serious problem in time uh, for that area. Uh, in addition to the size of the project, uh, they've asked for a five-foot standback where, uh, variance. Uh, <clears throat> they've asked for the FAR to, uh, to be increased. Uh, they've asked uh, uh, a height variance, which will go up above 40 feet. It's now 31 feet, as you're aware. I just, uh, and my neighbors are concerned about the lights, the noise, even the odor possibly from the restaurants. We're opposed to further development. We're not opposed to further development down there, but we just like to see something more compatible to the people on the, on the, on the rim and also to the businesses below. And I think if you don't do something about that, you'll find it's gonna be a disaster in the time to go ahead. Uh, we thought the Planning Commission made a wise decision. Uh, it was called up by Ed Selick uh, to uh, the City Council, and uh, that waived the fee that he would have had to pay, uh, money which would have gone to the city. Uh, it's also my recollection that several of you members on the City Council uh, <clears throat> were appointed to the City Council when Todd Ridgway was the, uh, the mayor of the city. And, you know, it, it, it just looks to me like that under the situation that you all decided that uh, he was a good friend and you were going to help him along with his project. I looked at all the stuff in the files that the city put out, and I thought that basically that most of it was uh, directed in his favor. In both of the two notices that went out, never did they mention the fact that the planning, that the, uh, uh, the garage itself was gonna have over 50,000 square feet. You had to go to the library. I went to the library one time to get the information and uh, they didn't have a copy in the library. So I had to come back over to the city. As you're informed, one of the homeowners above the property directly uh, has had the house in escrow twice, and both times it's fallen out of escrow because of the magnitude of this project. That means that the value of our properties is being reduced. Is the city willing to reimburse us for the loss in the value of our property because of the fact that you're changing the ordinances and allowing this huge project to go into existence? Or maybe some of you individually like to reimburse me. I could use the dough. <laughs> Without answering that question, Mr. Gerling, huh? your, your time is up. Will you be finishing can shortly I have a, here? What, uh, one more minute? Well, if you can do it sooner than that, that would be good. Okay. What I wanted to say in this thing is that uh, in, in my career, part of the time I worked as a financial planner and I had some very wealthy clients, and this is not a project in which I would have advised them to invest their money. It's, it's just something that I think in time will become a white elephant. 
and you wait to see. Take a look at Triangle Square. Triangle Square was a great going Jesse, and all of a sudden now, the only thing that's practically left are the theaters. So I would just be hopeful somewhere along the way that uh, you could reconsider your vote on this matter. I thank the two ladies for their vote. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public comments on this item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to Council. Councilman Selich. Yes, thank you. Well, I appreciate the gentleman's comments on the substance and issues regarding this project. We've already had the public hearing and voted on it, and this is the second reading of the ordinance, so I'll make a motion to approve the staff recommendation. Second. Motion and a second. Further conversation? Seeing none, please vote. Prior to reading the vote, I need to read the title for Ordinance Number 2011-22 for adoption, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach approving Code Amendment Number CA 2010-009, increasing the maximum development limit for property located at 100 to 300 West Coast Highway to 19,905 19, square feet. And with that, with Council Members Gardner and Daigle voting no, the motion carries. Thank you. On to the next item, um, Mr. Ray, you pulled item number 11. Uh, how much time are we allotting? Five minutes. Five minutes, thank you. Uh, Mayor Han, Honorable Council, I'm Steve Ray. I'm the Executive Director of the Banning Ranch Conservancy. Uh, item 11 has to do with a, uh, a uh, services agreement, uh, professional services agreement with Schmitz, Schmitz and Associates out of Malibu uh, related to both the Sunset Ridge and Marina Park uh, projects uh, before the Coastal Commission. I would like to address the Sunset Ridge Park uh, portion of that. It states in here that um, this is to, uh, to fund services required from uh, Mr. Schmitz and his associates in the amount of $76,236.50 uh, for his work. Uh, I would wish to point out that uh, you know, we have been working very hard as a citizens volunteer group <laughs> to um, find a way to uh, get the park built on Sunset Ridge, because first of all, we have not only been supporting, we, are ad we have been advocates of the park, uh, but uh, that we oppose that the, the roadway that has been chosen uh, through the Banning Ranch property to access uh, the park. So we have been working uh, to find a solution to that. We, uh, we do have, we think, a proposed solution to it, uh, and it, but it, it does involve uh, going through the scenic easement that is on the property, and this would require uh, conversation and negotiations between the city and uh, Caltrans uh, to do that. Uh, Mr. Schmitz informed me at a recent meeting I had with him that the city could not afford the $20,000 that it would take to pursue this uh, resolution uh, with Caltrans for the scenic easement. I would wish to point out that uh, resolution of this issue would save uh, everybody an awful lot of time and uh, headaches and everything and uh, especially would save a lot of money, especially for the taxpayers of this city. Uh, to me, I would think that $20,000 would be a, a very worthy investment to save many, many times that same sum of money. In addition, uh, Mr. Schmitz, when he informed me that the city did not have the money to pay that, I would just point out that this contract you're about to approve is you're paying him $76,000 to tell me that you don't have $20,000 to do this. So. It seems a little illogical, and uh, if you are going to continue to uh, employ Mr. Schmidt's services, I would ask that we be able to pursue, uh, you know, a resolution to this uh, whole pro project that's been going on and the problems relative to it. Uh, so I would ask uh, that you uh, advise Mr. Schmidt to uh, work with us to try to resolve that and would consider, uh, you know, spending the $20,000 because it will be well worth the investment. Second issue, uh, issue I'd like to bring up is there was an attachment to this professional services contract in the staff report and a letter sent from Schmitz and Associates dated July 26, 2011, uh, wherein uh, Mr. Schmitz outlines the 
duties that he is uh, performing for the city. And uh, one of the activities here, it says, and I quote, assist city in responding to opposition's misinformation campaign about project. Uh, I would wish to point out that, as I said, we are a volunteer group of citizens who are working very hard to try to work this out. We may have a different perspective than members of this council or Mr. Schmitz. We may uh, see and read information and facts differently from our perspective than yours. We are not conducting a misinformation campaign. For you to have one of your consultants uh, writing that kind of language, and I don't know if that's what the city described it as to him as what he was to do, or whether that's just language he chose himself, uh, but I would say that that kind of information or that kind of um, language uh, insults our integrity, uh, is offensive, uh, and uh, it is disrespectful, and it's flat wrong, and it, quite frankly shows a lack of class. Uh, and I think that kind of language is more reflective of those who use it than to whom it is aimed. And I would hope that you could advise the city, city staff, Mr. Schmitz, whoever was in, is involved in using this kind of language to describe a hardworking, uh, tax-paying group of citizens trying to work for the benefit of the citizens of this city uh, to uh, be more respectful in that matter. Uh, but again, back to the central matter, the issue of resolving this whole situation with just $20,000 payment. We think it's well worth it. Thank you very much. Okay. Are there any other uh, comments on this item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to Council. Move Council approval Member of the item. Curry. Move approval. Second. A motion and a second. Further comment? Please vote. The motion carries unanimously. Okay, next agenda item is item number 21. Mr. Mosher. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I'll be recusing myself at this time. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. My name is uh, Jim Mosher. According to the city manager's guide tonight's agenda, this item is your consideration and approval or denial of the assignment of the current 50-year lease for the Balboa Bay Club to a company owned by Winston Chung, a Chinese investor. I'm sorry to have forced Councilman Hill to leave the room, but I was surprised to see this on the consent calendar since I thought it deserved at least some comment. As you know, the Balboa Bay Club sits on prime harborfront property along Coast Highway, once thought to have been given to the city for public use by the Irvine family in the 1920s, uh, but later determined in the 1990s to be state tidelands held by the city and the public trust. Among the amenities that were added in the 1960s uh, were the terrace apartments along Coast Highway, which were referred to by some detractors at the time, rather ironically, as the Great Wall of China come to Newport Beach. Presumably the new assignee knows that under state law, these apartments are considered a non-conforming use and have to be removed by December 31st, 2044 or sooner if the lease is not being used as collateral for the other improvements. And I'm wondering if we are monitoring whether those apartments are still being used as collateral. Moreover, since 1995, state laws made the State Lands Commission a important partner in this venture by pledging to them, as I understand it, 10% of the revenue given to the city, which is supposed to be, by state law, the fair market rent for those properties. And I'm wondering whether we're monitoring that and if we have checked with the State Lands Commission as to whether we need their consent for assigning the lease to someone else. And also, of course, the obvious question of whether there's a problem putting land that is in trust for the people of California under the control of a foreign investor. However that may be, your duty tonight as trustees is to make three findings before assigning the transfer. Uh, the three findings are detailed in the staff report. Uh, I've obviously never met Winston Chung. He may well be a fine, upstanding businessman, but I would submit that based on the staff report, the public knows very little about him. The three findings you have to make are that he is, number one, wealthy, 
The consultant believes that to be true based mostly on the fact that he has a lot of cash. Qualification number two is he has to be a qualified resort manager, management person or manager and the consultant seems to be relying on some what vague promises that he's going to retain the current management for some unknown amount of time. Uh, item number three is that the assignee has to quote have a reputation for honesty, integrity, and sound business practices. And on that one it appears to me the consultant has really skirted around the issue. Uh, there is some vague mention of other people saying he's a fine upstanding businessman. He may well be but the consultant noticed that he's involved in three lawsuits with former associates and he mostly concludes that since he's so wealthy he's not going to go broke even if he loses those lawsuits. Uh, that to me is not necessarily an indication of uh, high integrity. So I would just say the public really knows very little about this gentleman or if the due diligence has really been done as to whether you as trustees should be approving this transfer. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public that wish to comment on this item? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to council. Council uh, Member Daigle. Yeah, uh, yes, I'd make the motion to approve the item with the uh, appropriate findings recommended by staff. And certainly under the management of uh, Mr. Wooten and Mr. Sheline, the club has always been so welcoming of our community. So I want to thank you for that and, and hope that that uh, spirit and practice uh, continues under the new management. So thank you. Motion. Uh, point. Council member, or excuse me, Mayor Pro Tem Gardner. Clarification about the assignment. Is there um, another body's approval that we need or is it just up to the city? Well, the um, State Lands Commission approved the original lease document which described the process that we're following. There isn't a process in the lease document that requires their approval. So um, it's our assertion that this is exactly what's needed, again, that the because the commission approved the lease in the first place. Okay, and it's, it's my understanding that, that Mr. Chung put up, put down some, put forward a considerable amount of cash as well uh, for the benefit of the, uh, the Bay Club. Is that right? You mean to purchase it? Yeah, I mean, but also yeah. to, for some improvements already or something. He's talking about improvements, that there are plans to go forward with the improvements to the apartments, for example, and that sort of thing. Oh, you mean interior improvements? Yeah. yeah I'm not aware yeah, no, of that's not the exterior, case or not. not yeah. exterior things. Um, I mean, s s do we have evidence of, of good faith on his part as far as what, what his commitments are? I know he, do we have, we have does he have contracts with the property management team, for example? Uh, not just his saying that he'd like to keep them, but we have contracts. There must be somebody here that knows yes, that. Uh, actually. <laughs> Working. He has contracts uh, with Mr. Wooten to continue on as management. The <coughs> consultant reviewed those contracts, found them favorable, most favorable, and that was part of that was con included in the uh, recommendation. Right, that's what I thought. So, so he does have the management side. Thank you. All right. Any other council comments? With that, uh, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. With council member. Hill recusing himself, the motion carries 6 0. Okay. Um, someone, oh, here he is. Good timing. All right. It is um, time for public comments on non agenda items. Does anyone wish to make a comment on a non agenda item? Please come down. Hello, my name is Daryl Ferguson. I'm with Surfrider Foundation, Newport Beach chapter. Uh, I just wanted to basically uh, let the city council know that uh, this Saturday, September 17th, is Coastal Cleanup Day. Uh, that's the the combination of the state, the county, and uh, other nonprofit groups getting together, trying to keep our waterways clean. Uh, I'd also like to uh, thank the city for the support that we get uh, from you for all the ordinances and uh, the maintenance that's done to keep our waterways clean. Uh, Surfrider Foundation, Newport Beach chapter, has a first Saturday of the month cleanup. 
anybody uh, is interested in that, they can get more information on our website at newportbeach.surfighter.org. If anybody wants to go to uh, Coastal Cleanup Day this uh, Saturday, there's uh, hundreds of sites. Just uh, do an internet search for Coastal Cleanup Day and uh, you'll find it. Thank does, you. Does the chapter have a, a site that they're yes, focusing we on? Yes, uh, we're going to host the site uh, of the lower Santa Ana River. We're in the river and along the trail. Uh, we're being accompanied by uh, Orange County Public Works. And that uh, that is actually right next to Labard Park in Huntington Beach. The biggest uh, cross streets there are Brookhurst and Adams. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other public uh, comments on non-agenda items? Okay, seeing none. Oop, sorry, please come ahead. Sorry about that. Um, good evening, Honorable Mayor Mike Hen and Council Members. I'm Kelly Sawyer, a citizen of Newport Beach. Good evening. Hi. Um, my name is Kelly Sawyer. I'm a citizen of Newport Beach. And I wanted to speak to you tonight um, on the protesting that's going on at iHeart Puppies. Basically, um, I viewed an article of our newly, uh, newly located Newport Humane Center and saw about 15 animals, you know, paraded around in celebration. And I couldn't help but think that this was it's such a sad representation of our city that we're putting these animals in shelters when our own shelter website states a, a large part of shelter population problem is called caused by pet store puppies that are maladjusted. Um, they get dumped a year or two later. I think, um, well, let me just go ahead and present you with evidence, more evidence. Um, what I'd like to state is there has been investigations into iHeart Puppies breeders um, into the puppy mills that supply I Heart Puppies, and it, there's irrefutable evidence. I have seven pages of U legal USDA reports of violations and citations from their breeders. I also have um, a media article uh, in the Newport Beach Independent that they owned up to backing them and supporting them after we found uh, the USDA violations as a reputable breeder, which they are not, um, that breeder actually has a uh, crime against the Animal Welfare Act, Nebraska law, and USDA violation. She tied a golden retriever to a pole and shot it in the head, and she left it there for the USDA officer to find. Not to mention the deplorable conditions that are caught on tape, videotape, um, by an undercover investigation as well. And of course, they own up to using that breeder and support them and promote them. Um, let me see. I Heart Puppies has been doing business um, with Midwest breeders that are where dogs are confined for life in wire cages, in freezing temperatures with no bedding, no shelter from cold, extreme heat, rain, wind, or snow. These dogs are injured, sick, and distressed. Um, it's further disappointing that many cities, including our neighbor Los Angeles, is progressively pursuing ban on pet store puppies due to the conditions that are a fact that they're born in. Um, the commercial dog breeding industry is not monitored well by the USDA. They don't have the resources. Uh, some of these are Glendale, Hollywood, Los Angeles, Tahoe. Is that me? I'm up. Um, yes. Uh, will you be finishing shortly? Yes. Time is up. Um, I would just also like to say um, I would greatly appreciate some insight or investigation into this store. They don't. Their bro uh, broker does not have a license. They're supplying Newport Beach with USDA live animals that are not regulated by the USDA, and that's a health hazard. And uh, they've committed felony in court. Um, you know, perjured themselves. I could just go on and on. It's just, um, I think this is a matter that needs to be urgently addressed on behalf of the citizens for our safety and for our beautiful reputation for being a preserver of life. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other public comment? Yes. 
Council members, Mayor Han, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm going to follow up on Ms. Sawyer's comments a little bit. Um, Rita Wilds, citizen of Newport Beach, taxpayer. Um, I'm going to ask you to consider a ban on the retail sale of animals in Newport Beach. All emotions aside, the issue is a public one. Since tax dollars are used to take in homeless animals and house them in city-run shelters, the shelters are overrun with animals right now. We're completely crowded and as Ms. Sawyer said, the, the puppy mills are part of the problem, the retail stores are part of the problem. In response to this global problem, cities like Lake Worth, Florida, Rio Rancho, New Mexico have recently adopted such ordinances banning the, the retail sale of dogs and cats. Many more across the country are working on similar bills. The city of San Francisco has begun work on the Humane Pet Proposal, an ordinance that would allow pets of all species to be acquired through, only through pet store adoptions, small breeders, or adoption from shelters. In California, the cities of Glendale, Hollywood, and Hermosa Beach have banned cat and dog sales at pet stores. And from Los Angeles to West Monroe, Louisiana, to New York, ordinances that have banned roadside animal sales all passed this summer. I urge you to position Newport Beach as a forward-thinking, cruelty-free city that respectfully supports profitable and humane businesses by banning the sale of live animals in our city. We're not anti-business. This ordinance would not shut anybody down. PetSmart and Petco are the, are the nation's largest pet retailers, and they do not sell cats or dogs. They have stated publicly that you cannot do it humanely and profitably at the same time. In fact, PetSmart's statement is, we created the PetSmart adoption program because each year 10 to 15 million pets are abandoned in the U.S. Of those, 6 to 8 million enter shelters and an estimated 3 to 4 million are euthanized simply because they do not have loving homes. We hope that Newport Beach will take the lead in this movement. It's very important to us. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Brenda Calvillo. I'm with the Animal Protection and Rescue League in Orange County. And I, along with thousands of people throughout Newport Beach, Huntington Beach, Coast Mesa, spend countless hours finding homes for homeless animals. Now, that's one issue. The other issue has been previously addressed is our tax dollars is being used to house homeless animals and euthanize them. The number one problem, how animals end up at shelters are from breeders and from pet stores. Now, the city of Newport Beach has outsourced its animal services to Huntington Beach. Now, the animals that I are puppy sells, the animals sold by Russo's at Fashion Island, a lot of them will end up at the shelter. And with our enormous homeless pet problem that we have in the U.S., we are adding more and more to the burden of this. So I urge the city of Newark Beach to please consider placing an ordinance to ban the sale of cats and dogs in stores. As has been previously mentioned, there lots of national successful businesses. I'm a small business owner myself, and I'm not against businesses. But when you do business at the cost of animals who are stuck in these cages in the Midwest for the duration of their entire life, and they're bred again and again, over and over and over again, you have to realize, where is the moral compass? Are you getting tax revenue at the cost of thousands of miserable animals for the benefit of a few? We have to consider of all the hundreds and thousands of volunteers who work tireless three hours to find homes for animals, because morally that's a just thing to do. And I urge the city council to please consider placing an ordinance to stop the sale of dogs and cats in retail stores. 
Thank you. Any other public comment? Seeing none, I'll uh, close public comment. It's uh, now time for all reports from city council members on committee activities. Council member Daigle. Uh, yes, I attended the, uh, uh, I don't think it's called the League of California uh, Cities, but it's an association of cities here in Orange County. And the issue before us uh, at the meeting was whether to uh, uh, support an amicus brief. Um, it has to do with this uh, redevelopment uh, issue. And uh, being duty bound, I think I voted as the council would want, and to, that it was to support the brief. And essentially, uh, the state uh, legislature has uh, uh, done another raid on local government coffers, and this time on redevelopment agencies. And so the, the gist of the amicus brief is that there was a Proposition 22 where voters said that uh, uh, the state could not raid local coffers uh, unless they paid us back, basically, over certain uh, conditions. And um, our thinking, at least what all city attorneys have always told me, is that judges uh, don't like when legislative bodies uh, defy the will of the voters. Um, so that's the, the argument of the amicus brief, which is somewhat of a, a sideshow to the main event. We'll see what happens um, with that. And essentially, you know, those with the state argue that uh, redevelopment agencies were created uh, by the state legislature, so therefore they are a creature uh, of the state, and the state can, uh, the state has the ability to modify uh, those uh, creatures. Um, so anyhow, we will see uh, where it goes. Um, but it's, it's basically a big fight about uh, one government taking another government's money. Um, so we'll see how things go. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Curry. <clears throat> we had a meeting of the Finance Committee uh, yesterday. And suffice it to say, the city is doing fine. We're ahead of schedule in terms of, ahead of projections in terms of our revenues. Uh, we finished with an even larger surplus than we had thought and reported at the last meeting. And our reserves, uh, while we've segregated out our capital uh, reserve, uh, so it's not part of the general fund reserve anymore, so it's specifically protected for capital purposes, uh, collectively our reserves are at the highest level they've ever been in the city's history. Which Thank is? You. Oh, 80 some million dollars or 90 something, about 90 million dollars. Uh, yeah, I was thinking like 88, 90 million, something like that. The actual number is 92 million. Okay. Do I hear 94? <laughs> oh, okay. All right, Council Member Selich. Uh, yes, on uh, August the 24th, we had the uh, Citizens Advisory Panel for uh, West Newport, which I'm the Council Liaison to at our meeting. It was the initial kickoff meeting, and the uh, citizens panel uh, looked at uh, the uh, Pacific Coast Highway and Balboa uh, Boulevard areas where landscaping uh, may be occurring. Uh, talked about some landscape concepts, and we'll be having our next meeting on the 28th of September, at which time we'll be um, receiving some landscape concepts from the landscape architect. Thank you. Council Member Hill. Yes, um, we had the uh, opportunity of the first uh, uh, Citizens Advisory, pa Advisory Panel meeting for the Kona Del Mar revitalization project. And they met on the last day of last month at Oasis. Uh, had a good turnout, a good discussion. Uh, the task is to work with the, the uh, vision plan that was created several years ago by the Kona Del Mar Chamber in concert with the Kona Del Mar Bid in concert with the Kona Del Mar Homeowners Association. Uh, and to look to see what of that today is still valid and what could, could move forward with it. Um, uh, at our next meeting, uh, we will focus on determining the, the, the geographical area that will be impacted or be utilized, if you will, uh, for this uh, revitalization effort. Uh, and that will be uh, in part, in a major part, determined by the, the technical aspects of road layout. And so the uh, engineering consultant to the CAP uh, is preparing several schemes that will be brought forward at the next CAP meeting. Uh, that will be evaluated uh, by the Citizens Advisory Panel as well as everyone else that attends. Uh, these meetings are very open, very informal kinds of meetings where, where everyone is encouraged to participate. And once a direction is, is taken for the, the road layout, 
then uh, the parameters of what the opportunities for pedestrian enhancement, for bicycle enhancement, and those types of things will take place. The next meeting is October 5. It will be held at Oasis once again, and they are meetings that run from 4 to 5.30 in the evening. We also had uh, the next meeting in a series of several of the Lido Village CAP, and the Lido Village CAP is focused on design standards for the existing city hall site, uh, Lido Plaza and Lido Village. And um, uh, we are in the process, or they are in the process, I guess I should say, of, of doing a review of the 80% uh, complete guidelines at this point in time. Uh, the primary discussion is over the fact that the consultant has done an excellent job of compiling a significant amount of information, so much that it's very difficult to weed through it. And so it's a matter of, of getting it uh, more succinct and, and more boiled down. and. Uh, and that will actually come before uh, the um, uh, Newport Revitalization Committee uh, Thursday of this week at the Thursday meeting of the uh, NRC here in this room at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And, uh, and then the next formal meeting of the Lido CAP will take place October 6, someplace in uh, Lido Village, yet to be determined as the location but that will be the, the first open house of, of even a broader public uh, hearing uh, of uh, the design standards uh, at that 80 percent uh, level. Thank you. Councilmember Rosansky. Yes, thank you. I had the opportunity to uh, attend the uh, wrap-up session for the West Newport Fourth of July Committee meeting, I believe it was on August 15th. Um, we had a presentation by the Police Department uh, with uh, you know, with regard to uh, the occurrences on the 4th of July. I think in general everybody was fairly pleased with uh, the results, uh, especially of the, uh, the family-friendly 4th of July celebration that we had uh, to kick off 4th of July morning. Um, the, the city sponsored a parade and then a, a kind of a, a fair, uh, a morning fair at the park uh, behind the Circle K there on uh, Balboa Boulevard. Uh, quite honestly, I, I came myself uh, by bike and I was coming up the street and I was hoping that at least 50 people would show up for the parade and there was well over 500 um, parents and kids and dogs and all, you know, all kinds of people there and they were led up the street by the fire truck. It was a, a wildly successful event. Um, so much so that I'd like to announce that um, I received an anonymous gift made out to the city of Newport Beach. I'll cover up the name here. but. I have a check in the amount of $5,000 that has been um, donated for next year's Family Friendly Fourth of July. And the donor who wishes to remain anonymous um, did so in the hope that there would be other residents in Newport Beach that were um, equally uh, uh, of a generous attitude that might support other uh, worthwhile endeavors of the city, whether it be dredging the harbor or community events or whatever it is, he was hoping that this would be seed money and spur others to be uh, equally as generous and open their pocketbooks. So I'd like to thank the anonymous donor and uh, hopefully we'll see a few more checks like this. Thank you. And I'll be now turning this over to the uh, city manager. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Gardner. Well, Sunday was the Coastal Car Classic. Um, down at Big Corona, and in the mayor's absence, I got to pick a car for an award. I, there was an absolutely stunning Auburn, completely. I, I mean, we don't know what luxury cars are nowadays. You look at those old Packards and something like the Auburn, and all the, the things they have, the little trays that pull out, and oh, those were the days. Of course, the gas mileage probably wasn't very good, but uh, they had a very successful turnout, lots of great cars, and uh, lots of people in attendance, so that was fun. And then um, we had a meeting of the Tidelands Management Committee, a great presentation on San Diego Creek and sediment loads. Uh, those of you who follow our problems in the Bay with dredging and everything realize that the San Diego Creek is our major source of sediment and talked about some of the programs to uh, reduce the sediment that's coming into the Bay and also discussing uh, more of our uh, dredging. And while we're talking about that, we need to give a hats hats off to our Harbor Resources Manager, Chris Miller, because I, I, I hope I don't jinx it, 
but this whole Rhine Channel dredging has been going, a, a massive amount of moving boats around and then getting in and out and trying to keep channels open for businesses and that sort of thing, done a, a marvelous job, and it's gone so smoothly, as I say, I hope I don't, don't jinx it by, by praising it too soon, but great job. I have not received a single email of complaint associated with that uh, dredging project in the Rhine Channel, which is absolutely amazing, considering how complicated it has been. So I'll second those comments on Chris Miller's management of this. Um, you may uh, notice a theme here on these committee reports, and that is we're doing a lot of reporting on revitalization. And I've got three more to report on here. Um, we're really going uh, great guns here in lots of directions to help this city get even better. There was a meeting of the Neighborhood Revitalization Committee. This is the overall overarching committee for these revitalization efforts. That was on August the 11th. We reviewed the progress of the various citizens' advisory panels and had a quick look at the design guidelines for Lido Village and uh, talked about the role of the Neighborhood Revitalization Committee, which at this juncture is really an oversight group uh, because the real work is being done at the citizen advisory panel level. Um, with regard to uh, the Santa Ana Heights uh, Citizens Advisory Panel, the first meeting was held on August 17th. Uh, it was a meeting devoted to introductory uh, information and description of the project. Um, and the next meeting will be held shortly, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the, uh, the Balboa Village Citizens Advisory Panel met on August the 23rd. Uh, we had really a, an excellent meeting. Uh, it, was, it was the first organizational meeting, but we took probably an hour of the meeting and uh, devoted it to an old-style yellow sticky uh, exercise uh, where we all wrote down what we thought were important aspects of what we wanted Balboa Village to look and feel like five years or ten years from now. And, uh, we had a lot of yellow stickies up on the board. It was a, it was a meeting that was attended uh, standing room only over at the Nautical Museum. And so we're in the process of um, boiling all that down and uh, we'll be trying to make uh, some cohesive sense out of all of those thoughts uh, at the next meeting. I'm very, very happy with how that first meeting went. Okay, that uh, takes care of uh, oral reports from city council members. Uh, now on to public hearings, the first of which is the Whitaker Residence Appeal. Generally the way these work is that we have a staff report and then we ask the applicant to give the applicant a chance to make any comments he wishes to make, take any other public comment. Usually uh, if there's a uh, person in opposition, uh, they'll speak and then at the end offer an opportunity for the applicant to make any wrap-up comments. Um, so. May we proceed with the staff report. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. As you've already mentioned, this is an appeal of a planning commission denial for a, a project that is composed of a, an addition to an existing residential unit and a new residential unit with a property that also contains a retail shop and a restaurant. And Ms. Fern Nguyen will give us our overview, and Nueno, excuse me. <laughs> nueno, yes. <laughs> Let's see if I can figure this out. So the mixed-use lot is on the corner of 15th Street and West Ocean Front. There's the two single-story commercial buildings fronting on 15th, the Stuff Surfer and the Surf Shop, and then behind that is a two-story residential structure, and the proposal is to increase um, add to the existing residential and then build a new residential above the commercial. The existing structures are non-conforming due to setback encroachments into the side setback, the northerly side setback, and the rear setback, and deficient commercial parking. However, the proposed project does comply with the residential parking standards of two parking spots per unit. The approvals requested are use permit for the addition of up to 75% and alterations of up to 75% to a non-conforming structure and then the modification permit for the setback encroachments. This project is being reviewed under the 1997 code because the application was submitted and deemed complete prior to the adoption of the new code. The applicant did request to be reviewed under this code because the project wouldn't be 
allowed without a variance under the, the new code, the current code. The proposed addition, you can see from the ocean front, uh, back here they're adding to the existing residence and then the new residential above, that's the stuff surfer there. And then north elevation is the view from the neighboring property. The proposed addition is 2,668 square feet, which is approximately 58% of the existing square footage. So I'm available for questions, and the architect and property owner are here. All right. Questions from council? Council Member Rosansky. I had a question. There was a calculation in the report with regard to the, I guess, the value of the improvement as compared to the value of the existing, and there had to be it couldn't exceed 75 percent. Was that accurate? The two of the findings that were brought up in Mayor Hen's appeal and were also discussed at the Zoning Administrator hearing and the Planning Commission meeting uh, were these two findings that relate to the cost of the improvements and the cost of the non-conforming condition and the cost of the, the value and the cost of the things proposed, but then there's also the limitation on up to 75% of the addition and 75% alteration. So, okay, so it's two separate. Yeah, so the, I saw somewhere in there, I think the value you placed on the existing non-conforming condition was like a million and a half dollars or something, or that was the assessed value? Uh, that was in there in the resolution for approval. The, the main uh, numbers that are important are the cost of the proposed project, which is $550,000 approximately. Yes. And that has, that would deal with the cost of improvements to be made, which is minor in comparison to the value. And then also the cost of correcting was, I believe, 850000 approximately. 860. 860, yes, sorry. Okay, so going along with the first bullet point there, how much are you valuing? Is the value of the non-conforming condition the entire value of the property or just the, the non-conforming commercial structure? That's one of the problems why I think the, the commission had struggled with this and it was a split vote is because the these two findings are very difficult to quantify. The value could mean a monetary cost or it could just mean the value of the non-conforming condition. The existing mixed-use structure couldn't be built today under the current code if it were demolished unless there was discretionary approvals, a parking waiver or something, a uh, variance approved. So the value, it is subjective, but it would include the cost of uh, correcting the nonconforming condition and also just the value of having <coughs> the nonconforming parking and the nonconforming encroachments. Wait, you're saying the value of the existing nonconforming condition would include the cost of making it conforming? Why would anybody, mm -hmm. how, how is that a value? No one would buy it in that case. Sorry, okay, I guess that's more in reference to the next finding would be the cost of correcting it. So the value has to do with the monetary value, I guess, of, well. This is something we just make yeah. up. It's, it's like, I mean, it sounds like it. There's no real rational basis for that. It's just <laughs> like if we think it's minor, then it's minor. And if we say it's not minor, <laughs> then it's not minor. Well, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. I mean, there's a commercial building there. I, I would assume it has a value. I mean, even if you look at the assessor's role, the assessor's role is going to split the value between the land and the, and the structure. So do we know what the assessor's value of the structure has? That number is in the findings of approval. Let me see if I can find that. One million five hundred. Is that the land and the building or just the building, just the improvements? I find it hard to believe that that building is worth a million and a half bucks. Yeah, total Just value the of the property. It's both. You can rebuild it for a third of that. So, I, so it's the total value of the property. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So there was no, no, there's no distinction here between the cost of the existing non-conforming condition, which I believe, in my mind, is the building, not not the building plus the land. I mean, because what we're really getting at is here, is the relationship of this new addition to the to what would have to be torn down or whatever. The land is the land. The land is not going anywhere. The land is always going to have its value. It's probably be more valuable if the building wasn't there because there's a cost of demolishing the building. But uh, so it, staff's assessment is based upon the entire value. Is that how you came to your conclusion or, or, or that's how we're supposed to come to a, a finding here? 
all of these things should be in included in your decision, but my original recommendation for approval was based on the value, of, not the monetary value necessarily, but just the value of having a mixed-use structure. It's a double lot, so being able, being able to have the two commercial structures and two residential as a part of a mixed-use project. And if they were to demolish it, they wouldn't be able to rebuild it, so that value is higher than the $550,000 for adding the new structure. But it's all, as Mayor Hen brought up in his appeal, it's all subjective. In the new code, the, these conditions weren't carried over. It was, it's done differently in the new code, so. Yeah, this is, this is why these provisions aren't in the new code, right? Yes. It's hard to understand them. Yes. Yeah. And as part of this, not only is, are they building the addition you know, they're building an addition there, but they're they're asking for a variant or a modification, I guess, to allow the uh, um, the, the upstairs to encroach into the setback. The two modification requests: one is for the rear setback, and there's there's the existing garage is already in the rear setback, so it would just be um, the carport it would be in the proposed, and then the de a deck above, and then the side yard setback encroachment of five feet actually might go away if the, uh, once Coastal Commission reviews the application for the next door neighbor's uh, amendment, Coastal Land Use Plan Amendment, they are currently zoned for residential, and it's before you tonight, I believe, the second reading. <laughs> but uh, if Coastal Commission approves it and it becomes a mixed-use property, again, that five-foot setback actually goes away. It's only there because the property is zoned residential, even though there's a mixed-use structure on it. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Gardner. I, I have to say this one has really confused me. <coughs> um, Sorry. And so uh, please bear with me while I go through a few things. But one of the things is that it could be as little as an 8% alteration, somewhere between 8% and 75% 75, 75 being the maximum allowed. But you're adding, uh, say you're increasing square footage by 58%. So how can you only have an 8% alteration when you're increasing square footage by? There, there are two separate items, I guess the 75% alteration limitation is based on the existing uh, exterior structural walls. Okay. So, uh, oh, I don't have it up here, but the exterior walls, the foundation and the roof, uh, they are requesting up to 75%, although their initial calculations say as little as eight. Because they don't know what they're gonna find when they exactly. get in there. Exactly, and they, they did. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, and then, Oh yeah, there's the county's assessor, a one million five. All right, and then there was something about the the abutting properties designated for for residential use. So you were saying that this will be that part of it's going to be reconciled. Correct. Okay. And assuming the coastal commission approves the land use. The amendment. trash. There was an issue. Of the trash. The trash is not going to be out. It'll be covered. Yes. Uh, protected. There, there has been some neighborhood complaints, but in the resolution for approval, there are two conditions about trash and the, the property owner has agreed to move the trash onto this on site okay. and make sure it's covered. Okay, before I forget, it talked about in condition 22 about uh, sewer laterals having clean outs and we just had a presentation at Coastal Bay Water Quality about how s we're moving away from that or something. There's some concerns about that so I hope we check with uh, utilities on that before making a requirement if we are actually trying not to require it. I'm not, I'm not clear on that. What about the structural integrity. The, um, the proponent of the project feels, uh, has a, an engineer that says, hey, there's no problem, Correct. you can build. But we have an architect from another, from a neighbor who says, wow, it could really be a damage, it could screw up my whole house, basically, because walls could fall in. These are where, I don't, I mean, I'm not trying to ask you to say, well, one person's absolutely wrong, one person's absolutely right, but how do we evaluate those kinds of claims? If I may, we will be evaluating um, the structural integrity of the project through the building permit process and the preceding plan check process. So we will know precisely, um, you know, what is going to be um, designed into the building 
if we encounter something in the field that is contrary to what the assumptions were, we'll make an appropriate adjustment at that time. If it is outside the bounds of the proposal of no more than 75 percent alteration to the existing building, then we'll have to stop and make appropriate adjustments so it doesn't exceed that threshold or come back and get additional approvals. Okay. All right, for the time being. Council Member Hill, you're an architect. I'm sure you can shed some light on some of these issues for us. Well, I'm probably the only one at the DS that's more confused than Council Member Gardner. <laughs> um, I guess I just have a whole slew of questions. I mean, I see conditions where they're only allowed to uh, remodel 75% of the non-conforming structure, structural, um, you know, but what happens when they tear into it if they find they have to do more and the project is underway? Uh, they're limited in the dollars that they can spend supposedly to qualify, but I mean, so 550000 I mean, so what if it becomes a million? Uh, it doesn't seem that there's any controls over that, that once the shovel's on the ground, uh, uh, it proceeds. Um, I had the experience of, of looking at taking a single-story building on the peninsula and adding a second floor to it, and when we finished the liquefaction calculations on it, there was no way. Uh, and so I don't understand how a, a footing on a building of the age of, of that with with all of our code changes for seismic and uh, uh, current information on liquefaction, uh, how that those footings could comply in any way, shape, or form. Um, and then uh, uh, I, I toured the property today and uh, and I have a, a great concern over the zero setbacks, uh, regardless of the utilization of the property next door. I mean, it's, it's going to uh, uh, eliminate uh, light uh, in the property next door, and it's going to give them a wall uh, without openings as well, uh, except they have all the ocean side. But I mean, it just, it just doesn't seem logical uh, as to what they're trying to do. Councilman Rosansky, your light's on. Did you have a... No. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I had a question. I just want to make sure I understand about this trash location. It's not going to be on the street. Correct. So it'll be on the... It would be within the property boundaries and covered. Yes. Okay. And there was a... There was an assertion at one point along the way that I think was dealt with in the staff report, but I just want to be sure. There was an allegation at one point that the entire commercial, because of the way this 75 percent calculation works, there and because part of the project is residential as versus commercial, that there was a scenario under which the entire commercial space could be, in effect, torn down and rebuilt and perhaps expanded. Uh, would you comment on that? Is that a possible outcome based upon the approvals we're being asked to make here? No. It, should the council choose to approve this and limit it to 75 percent alterations, that d would not include demolishing up to 75 percent of the structural walls and rebuilding it. Structural alterations is separate from demolishing and rebuilding, so they would only be able to alter the structural members up to 75 percent. Okay. So there's no way that there could be an expansion of the commercial space putting further pressure on the non-conforming parking situation. Correct. Okay. And also, if going back to the trash, if you wanted to amend the trash conditions to make it more specific about being located on site and covered, we could. We just have uh, seven and eight, which are standard conditions for trash, and I think that that does what the neighbors wanted it to do, but we could add a sentence if the council wanted to do I, that. I don't have any desire to do that. I do, I do want to come back to this structural calculation, though, one more time. Um, doesn't city staff have to review these calculations? Yes. And the plan? Yes. And so, based upon staff's review, you're, you're satisfied. Staff's review, n not just review of what the plan is, but apparently there were some structural borings taken, some, some sampling done regarding the foundation. 
Yes, before the applicant even applied for these approvals, they did hire a structural engineer to come out and look at the property, and a letter was submitted with the application to show that uh, it was structurally sound that they could do the project without tearing down the existing commercial walls. And we did, uh, one of the attachments does show the 8% structural alterations that it could be, and during plan check, we would verify all of those numbers this to make sure it's this, under the 75%. This was a certified bonded uh, structural engineer that gave you these calculations. Yes. And we have similarly qualified people on staff that looked at these submissions. Yes. Reviewed them and accepted them. Yes, but that is something that will be I realize, it's, I realize yes. that it's subject to field conditions, you know, and that there is this risk of getting into a project that never ends because of what you find. I don't believe there was any soil analysis done. They just made the assumption of what the bearing capacity of the soil would be, according to the report, anyway. Perhaps when the applicant comes up, we can go through the report. The engineer is also here with the architect and property owner. Well, I think we'd have to defer the experts. I mean, that sort of thing is kind of above our pay grade, soil analysis. I mean, I just, I think your approach you're taking is prudent, makes sense. You know, we have experts and we'll retain them to make these assessments. Uh, well, I'm, I'm certainly not personally uh, qualified to override judgments of these engineers, but uh, I just wanted to verify that, you know, what has happened at least to this point. I do note that the person proposing this project is going to be living in it. <laughs> um, I would presume he would uh, prefer to be able to sleep soundly at night. I have another question just about the basic, what they're attempting to do. So are the existing garages coming down that are on the property line along the back alleyway and then being replaced with a carport with residents over the top of the carport and deck? Is that what I understand it to be? The existing garage walls will probably remain in place and become the carport walls, and then the garage will be built behind it new. And yes, there will be additional residents above with a deck. Behind it meaning further? Towards 15th Street. 15th Street. I, I guess one other anecdotal experience that I have had in doing projects in this town that are non-conforming is approval was not given allowing any expansion of non-conforming that you gained approval if you could show that you were you were minimizing or reducing the amount of non-conforming you could use residential entitlements and take them up to the maximum and achieve that if you were reducing the commercial entitlements on a mixed-use property but never expanding the commercial and the residential simultaneously and furthering the, uh, the nonconformance. And so I'm confused as to whether or not they're expanding the nonconformance based upon the approvals that they're asking. The commercial structures will not be intensified or enlarged. It's just adding square footage to the existing residential and then the addition of a new residential unit. So because it's a non-conforming structure, that's why they need to go through this use permit process, but the commercial will not be expanded. And, and then once again, the fact that they're going through this process puts everything up for grabs. Yes. Well, you know, I guess the other side of the coin is, is that we should look for some way to encourage them to improve the piece of property. It deserves improvement. Uh, but And so to me, that boils down with an issue, really, of setbacks. And, I mean, the cost is going to be what the cost is, and the structure is going to be what the structure is. And I don't care what limits you put on it, reality will be reality. Uh, and if they're going to go ahead, to me, the issue then is the setbacks. All the rest of it's academic. Could I follow up on that? Sure. I want to ask Rush. M my sense of not being an architect or an engineer was they're going zero lot line because there's a wall there and you build the wall on the wall and that's that's where you get your support but could you set back the second story or something from that wall without I don't know I mean can you do that and the answer is yes you can do that structurally you have to you have to beef up the beams and that type of thing but that in fact is what 105 the neighbor next door has done in the back part of their house 
their, their first floor is on the property line, the second floor is set back. Uh, that's what you'll see on Balboa Island if you go down Balboa Island in different places. Right. Well, that's part of our general plan design guidelines was right. the, more right. of that. Okay. Right. Council Member Selich. Yeah, I think, I think we're missing the point on the setbacks, though. The fact is that the property next door is going to be mixed use, which means it becomes, by zoning, it's going to be a zero setback, it's assuming the Coastal Commission is going to approve that project. So, I, and, I, and, I, and I realize that there are some setbacks on that property, but even so, the, uh, with that property being mixed use, the code setback becomes zero for this particular property. Um, just one other comment. Um, you know, these non-conforming, the most difficult part of writing a zoning code is non-conforming uses and non-conforming structures. And I've been part of two zoning code rewrites. I was on the committee that wrote those 1997 things that were up there. I think I was chairman, but I won't admit it. And obviously, obviously, we didn't do a very good job of cleaning it up because in, in the last rewrite, we went back and, and tried to deal with it again. So we're never going to come up with the perfect answer. It's always going to be coming down to some value judgments on what's best for the community when we make our decisions in these things. So you can't explain what you wrote in 1997, is that? I don't even remember it. <laughs> okay. Well, good. That's perfectly clear. All right, any uh, further comment? All right, let's hear from the applicant. <coughs> Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, I don't have a whole lot to add other than the fact that, that uh, I want to add Can you uh, give us your name? Oh, Joe Angelo, excuse me. Uh, so I live in the residence uh, next door to the Stuff Surfer. Uh, we bought the property 13 years ago. Uh, I own the Stuff Surfer restaurant, and I rent to Dave Moon, who's been uh, the owner of the surf shop for about 20 years. Um, I want to add an apartment over the, the two existing uh, commercial structures and add, uh, expand the house to the back. Uh, we do have, I believe, and the architect will address this, but, but uh, the alley on the left side there, uh, we, we have the two garages and then the residence is going to be set back. Uh, so I, I've just instructed the architect and, and, and Mr. Rahuna, who, who is here, and we, we uh, had Mr. Rahuna look at, at those footings, and I've just indicated to both of them that, that uh, you know, if anything, I want this structure to be over-engineered. Uh, so I'm not looking for this structure to fall down. I mean, I am going to be living in it. Um, and uh, I'm going to make that building a better looking building, the stuff surfer and the surf shop. I mean, I have uh, design wise, I want to use smooth stucco and perhaps Katerra stone or some other type of stone on it. Um, in the 13 years I've owned the property, uh, I, I remodeled what was a, a sort of a white A-frame shingle house. Uh, it had a, an attic studio and, and a two bedroom downstairs. So that's the house I live in now. and I. I uh, remodeled that house about six years ago, and, and uh, I get a lot of good comments from people walking down the boardwalk, you know, what a nice job you did. Um, it, it's my intention to, uh, you know, this property is going to stay in my family. You know, I'm not, I'm not moving, and uh, my sons, I have two sons, 20, 23 and 25. Uh, you know, I hope this property stays in the family for the, that generation and, and their kids. Uh, so other than that, I mean, I've listened to the comments, and. And uh, I, I sort of agree with everything that's been said. Anybody have questions? Any questions of Mr. Angelo? Okay. Thank you, Joe. Okay. My name is William Azzolino. I'm the architect for Mr. Angelo. Um, I'd just like to address a couple um, comments specifically. Um, with reference to the question of the zero lot line setback, essentially your approval in item number four of the agenda tonight of Mr. Nero's property um, eliminates any setback questions between the two existing properties. Um, we're not proposing to um, increase the existing setback 
uh, non-compliance, we're actually reducing it in that we're pulling back the second story, the existing residential, where we're proposing it against the alleyway, which is the rear yard setback, um, into compliance with the existing um, bylaws. Uh, and uh, similar to Mr. Nero's property adjacent to, it, uh, adjacent to the property. Um, we will also be addressing all of the issues concerning earthquake, uh, liquefaction, We've already looked at the um, soils we've made in our comments thus far. Uh, Mr. Ahuna had, uh, before we started the project, we excavated the project to take a look at the foundations um, to see what the building was on. Um, we've examined those. Uh, he's satisfied that they are um, capable of handling the existing building. We have concrete block walls, and the, and the structure itself seems to be quite sound. We haven't found any issues of termite. We've, we've pretty much crawled all over the property. Um, we're not expanding the non-commercial uses. Um, at all, the existing commercial buildings are going to be the same size as they are. Um, we've made provision for the um, enclosure of garbage on the property. We've actually suggested to Mr. Angelo that in advance of the construction um, that he could locate the existing trash bin, which has been out in the street and which the community makes use of in the, in the summer, other than Mr. Angelo. He actually carts away a lot of uh, other people's garbage. Um, that he can put it inside his property, he can provide it with a closed door immediately between the two existing buildings, which is where it is ultimately proposed to go. Um, we're also looking at bringing, bringing it in from the rear, but at the moment there is a location that we've identified on the plans where it would go and would be enclosed and not visible from anybody on the street, electronically controlled. Um, above and beyond that, um, if you have any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions? No, thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else, uh, Mr. Angelo, is there anyone else from your group that you had intended to make I comments? I guess, I, Mr. Mayor, I'm sorry. I do have Go one ahead. question, if I may. Sure. Could you, could someone give him a pointer so he could show the, uh, the uh, east, the west boundary of the carport? Uh, the existing carport right now is, that, is line. that line right there. Right. This is the actual property line, and if you go to the next slide. The right one. Okay. Uh, this is where the so the edge of the existing property line is here. The edge of the existing garage and carport is there, and here is the second floor that we've set back, um, a full ten feet in compliance with it with the current codes. But the first level carport is right where the existing garage is. Correct. So there's no change in that setback that you're providing. We did not provide. We we have not provided one there. No. We were basically trying to avoid demolishing any more of the existing structure than was necessary. The owner requested that we retain as so much of the existing structure as possible. How deep is your carport? Uh, carport is 19 feet, 8 inches deep. Let me go back. Sorry. From there to there is 19 feet, 8 inches, or 20 feet. Okay. Thank you. All right, was, was there anyone else from your group you wanted to make any comments? All right, um, is there anyone in opposition to this application uh, that would like to make comments? Please come up. And then after, after the opponent uh, makes any comments, then I'll call for general public comment. Good evening, my name's Maury Nero. I live at 105 15th Street, immediately adjacent to the applicant's property. Uh, this thing is, uh, there's so much to this that it's almost mind-boggling. Now, I've been a builder and a real estate developer for the last 30 years, and it's almost incomprehensible what they're presenting. Uh, they, there's been a lot of conversation here about uh, the footings and one thing and another. It, well, let me, let, me, let me go back. I'll start, I better get in order here. Um, Twenty years ago, we built our house according to Newport Beach planning and, and uh, building code carefully, and it's exactly in compliance. We built our, uh, our house with the full expectation that somebody at some time would build in front of us. And I would expect at that time that they would have to comply with the building code in Newport Beach just as I did. No different. Now, we <clears throat> planned our house carefully with that idea in mind. The access, 
and the view, the um, lighting, particularly lighting, and the parking were all uh, <coughs> built to those parameters. In other words, with the idea in mind that it would, somebody would build in front, <coughs> excuse me, someone would build in front of us. Now, uh, Joe Angelo, your applicant, is trying to circumvent the necessary parking for his commercial establishments by combining the two lots and therefore he can take advantage of the grandfather clauses, if you will, in the building. Um, the, the, the drawings, now this is the essence of it, the drawings as they're submitted have no uh, foundation plans at all. All of your conversation leads to the foundation and they didn't submit anything. All they say is they want to be able to destroy seven, or demolish or destroy 75% of the existing structure. Now that will cover the, the total destruction or, or demolition of the surf shop and the restaurant, both. Now, when I built my house, the very first problem that I ran into when I was trenching for the foundation under my slab, it's immediately adjacent to the surf shop. When we got down deep enough to satisfy two-story two construction, I was way below the foundations of the surf shop. So in order to pour my foundation, I had to retain dirt or sand underneath the, the surf shop and do it in eight feet sections so that it didn't collapse into my trenches. It was quite a little, you can understand the problem. Now, I don't care who this engineer is, I've seen what's under the surf shop. And I, I've bored a whole lot of holes in cement myself and present them to engineers. Now, I, he bored them in the wrong place, I'll tell you that, because he doesn't know what he's talking about. Now, <clears throat> there is a real possibility in the, in the event of a moderate earthquake, his building actually could fall into mine as it's drawn. Now, he could redraw it, but as it's drawn, he shows that he's going to use this, the walls and foundation of the surf shop to support the structure, a large structure, overhead. Now, the only way that he can do that is he'll have to destroy a great deal of the surf shop and the restaurant in order to put in satisfactory side, gr size <clears throat> grade beams to support the steel that will have to support the second floor. None of this is addressed. All of this is assumption. He's asking you to give him a, a carte blanche to do whatever he wants to do. And once he starts a project, how are you going to go backwards? You can't. If you let him start it, then, then there's going to be no turning back. And every six months he can come back and say, well, we're working on some other grade beams or we're trying to do this or that. And the project may never get built. In the meantime, I've got to live next door to it. The Saturday, and he specializes in Saturday and Sunday uh, construction. In other words, <clears throat> it's his business how he runs his life. But that little house that should have required about four months to remodel it took him four and a half years. And that's because he did all the work on the weekends, Saturday and Sunday. He might not do that this time. Don't misunderstand me, but that's the way he did it in the past. Now well, my time's up. Well, uh, sir, uh, I'll allow you some additional time if you. Uh, All right, I appreciate. Do you, have, do you need you. very much more time? Um, do, now, the restaurant and the surf shop existed in the 1920s. That's what 80, 90 years they've been standing at that location in that non-conforming configuration. It's your job or your decision tonight to decide if you want to add another 80 or 90 or 70 years to non-conforming structure on oceanfront where it's, it affects all the beachgoers and the uh, uh, traffic, that it, and it really affects us. Um, well, let me finish. The, one of the things that's very important is the trash bin. It's been in the street, and it's an ob objectionable to my tenant and it's objectionable to the beachgoers and the oceanfront users. It's, it's just uh, unsightly and it's unsanitary. I, I provided you with a picture of it, I think. It's just, that's an ordinary occasion. Uh, 
Now, very quickly, I'd like to, uh, well, I've covered that. I, oh, I, I think that's enough. Um, if you, if there's, I can just go well, on sir. and on and on. But if there are some questions, I'd like very much to answer them because I've, I've built there. I know what this project is. Please, if you have any questions. All right. Do we have any questions uh, for Mr. Nero? Council Member Hill. It does cause me to ask another staff question. Uh, these, there's two separate lots now, and part of this is combining the lots? Yes, or, or that's, the lot? the, that's his intention, to combine them so that he doesn't have to conform. I'm sorry, I'm asking staff. Oh, I'm for, sorry. Uh, <laughs> two, two separate now, and, and the part of this process is combining? Correct. The first zoning administrator uh, hearing was for both items, and the lot merger was not appealed, so that was approved. So the, the lots have been merged already? They have not been merged yet, but there's been approval for it. I see. And so that's not part of the debate? No. And previously we had a covenant to hold it together because that residential structure crossed the property line. I so see. we would prefer the lot merger because it's already So in possible. other words, there were no setback requirements when those places were built and being two separate properties, they were both allowed to zero or less than zero? The, there is some maybe three feet between here, but on the boardwalk side and on Mr. Nero's property side, there was zero setback requirements. Uh, I guess I'm talking about the north-south axes. Oh, I'm sorry. So the lots, all right. Sorry, this is north. Right there. Yeah. All right. I was confused because of the opening between the two buildings when I walked it this morning. Does that opening remain? Uh, there is a gate on this side, and I believe you can just walk through the stairs on that side. But there's no plan to, to remove that and no. make it into square footage? No, they plan on keeping that. They're not going to increase the commercial. But there's also there's an opening running north and south as well. Yes, right. Yes, and so that opening disappears now. I believe this is where they might no. propose the trash enclosure, and there there is an existing... Or there is an existing wall there, I believe. Yes. Okay. But you can't see that. It's on Mr. Nero's property side. Thank you. Uh, questions of staff relating to something you said. The trash bin, say we say you, you can't build what you're proposing. Does the tra trash bin stay then in the street? I mean, is, is it that's where it's supposed to go? It has, we, it seems a little weird that this is just where it is, but um, uh, there would be no other provision for it then. We can look at other Sydney or city ordinances that uh, reference trash bins and see if there's a way to make sure it stays on his property, even if this isn't approved. Okay. And then um, just the, this, the thought of that he had to go below the foundation of the existing foundation of the neighbor to build his own foundation, does that give anybody second thoughts or hesitations about um, structural. I mean, I, I, I'm, I have no idea, so I'm just looking for reactions. As That's exactly the condition that we ran into. We determined that, that if we were to proceed with the two-story, because we're zero lot lying to a, a building, uh, that the slough off of the sand was acute and that we would have to do pours in about six feet maximum uh, in order to keep the building adjacent to us from, from sagging. That's doable, right? Okay. Okay. All right. Are there any other questions? Does anybody have a question, Mr. Nero? Okay. Did you? Is there anybody else that you yes. were intending to yes, have come I'm, up? Yes. I'm going to be represented by Todd Schooler, the architect. All right. So well, that's and, fine. And if you would like to come. Some other people. One, one for each of you. There's actually more than one than so, one for so each of you. There's, there's three packets of seven pieces of paper. Is that the yeah, there's more than that. That was a test. <laughs> it's not just a book for you, Leslie.
Uh, good evening. My name is Todd Schooler. I'm an architect and a general contractor. And uh, I, I shudder to say this, but 20 years ago I did design Maury's house because that proves that I am an old person. Um, I am. I have just a few few points I'd like to make. One of them I'd like to talk about the 75% alteration deal um, and what our concerns are because I'm the one that brought that up. Uh, the way I see it and what is written in the staff report on the front page does say that the use permit would not allow demolition, demolition and, and rebuild of the existing structures. But it doesn't actually say that in the resolution. It, it, in, and my concern is this. There's two components to this design. There's an existing residence, and there's also an existing commercial building that's 80 to 90 years old. This calculation is taken from the total of those two buildings. And our concern is whether they demolish or systematically take <coughs> apart the existing commercial building and put it back together by saying, yeah, we're not demolishing, we're just taking this stud out and putting another one in as they go down the road. How do we prevent that? Is there a way of preventing that? Or is there a way, if you choose to approve this tonight, at the Planning Commission meeting, the applicant's architect had said that they were, they actually intended to, to remove, demolish, rebuild, however, whatever term you want to use, quite a bit less than 75% of the existing commercial space. If there's a way that you can find a way to limit them to what they say or give them some leeway so they can do that, if you choose to approve that, then Maury would feel more comfortable because we know it's all going to be engineered right. If they have had Steve Ahuna, who's, a, is a, who's an engineer I've known for a long, long time since his hair wasn't gray and I actually did have hair, um, is a fantastic engineer. And if they say that they can structurally hold this thing up, he'll see to it that it happens. But we would like to, s like to make sure that they don't take apart a commercial space that doesn't have any parking, it does not conform to that, and then put it back together so that way they get more commercial space than they would if they had to build a brand new building, which makes their building a lot more valuable. While Murray, Maury had to had has quite a bit smaller commercial space because he had to provide parking for his. That that's the concern. Um, one of the main reasons why they are, and I, I I've given you both the old code and the new code to look at regarding non-conforming, sorry Ed, but is that one of, the, one of the main reasons they are asking to stay within the 1997 code instead of saying, hey, let's just go and do it for the new code because the new code is quite a bit more lenient on alterations. But on additions, you're limited to only 50% and they would have to get a variance for that. And the likelihood of maybe getting that variance is probably less than this. Um, and I think, Mayor Han, that was one of the questions that you had in your appeal from what I read. So I wanted to touch on that. Also, I'd like to say, is this actually realistic? And, and Councilman Hill touched on this, to put a brand new structure on top of an 80 or 90 year old building and say, okay, yes, yeah, it's, it's going to work. I, as an architect and a builder, it scares me. And, I, and I'd hope that we'd look at that really close and make sure they stay within what they say they're going to do. And, and maybe the architect can touch on that when he comes up here. Um, I gave you a handout on the cost, and maybe that can shed a little light on where I was coming from on that. Whether, however, if, I'm just about finished here. All right. However we look at it, the applicants supplied the numbers, and they're saying that it is, 
one cost per square foot to build the whole building and another cost per square foot to replace the nonconformity. And they're so far, they're so much different that it just doesn't add up to me. And in our construction company, I'm the numbers guy. I'm the one that does all the bid building, bidding, and I know how much it costs to build a building. And to me, a more realistic cost is the lower number, the cost to replace, is at $364 a square foot, while they're saying the cost to build this whole new thing. And I use the calculation saying, the remodel of the existing is free is $159 a square foot. It, it's got to be one or the other. It can't be both. Um, in closing, I just want to reiterate Maury's concerns. And that is that they're not trying to find a way around providing parking for a commercial space. And that make them put that trash enclosure in. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if you like. Go ahead. Could you, in just a couple of sentences, what, so just to clarify for me, what would make this project, in your mind, acceptable? What sort of things would the council say that you go, okay, I feel much better about it? Well, there's two ways to look at it. You know, we did rewrite that new zoning code for a reason, and, and and, it, and while the old zoning code on nonconforming, that, these percentage rules, that was pretty crazy. And it's hard to follow, and especially the cost part is, is also crazy. If it was me, I would say, hey, come back to us at 50%. The other way is, hey, if you're going to do this, you better make sure you save that existing commercial space because the reason, the whole purpose in my mind of the non-conforming building is that you do save these old structures, not find a reason to completely demolish it and then rebuild it and get extra square footage out of it than you would have gotten if you had to build new. That's it. I got a question. Sure. Todd, I got a question for you. Yeah. Um, I don't know if these numbers are right, the $159 and the $364 a square foot, but typically isn't it more to do commercial than residential per square foot? Not necessarily. Um, you know, buildings are buildings, and, and the type of construction is the type of construction. Now, they're going to be doing type 5 construction, which is basically the same. Uh, if they're going to be building the tenant improvement, uh, then, yeah, it's going to be more. But if they're just providing an empty space for the tenant to come in and improve themselves, it'll be less. But, and I know you're, you've been involved in construction for a long time. We've had a lot of talks about this. These numbers are so far different that it just doesn't look right to me. And, and you know me after being on that committee for so long. I'm the guy with my calculator out all the time. And I looked at that and right off the bat, I said, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. And, and it, it, it's, it, it can't be that way. When was the last time you were able to, what decade were you able to build 7,000 square feet for 159 bucks a square foot? Okay. Um, other public comment? Anyone? Thank you for having me. My name is Marat Kunzi, and I'm the acupuncturist who's Maury's tenant. And um, I'm concerned about the, um, all the parking or the lack of parking between Joe's place and my place, our place, and across the alley, there's 10 parking places or 11 parking places. And with two more people living there and their friends, I think it's going to be really a tight fit. And um, I'm also concerned for, because my business, I like it to be quiet as an acupuncturist and with um, construction and then the possibility of unruly neighbors who want to play loud music. I'm <laughs> not interested in that or I wouldn't like that. So, um, so thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Hi. Uh, Matt Sliskin. I have a 
just a couple comments, and one goes to something said earlier this evening about the fire pits. And uh, very briefly, um, I think a solution that might be very helpful, which was mentioned a couple years ago, is just making sure that people don't have any tent-type structures. Excuse me, Max. Uh, we're on the, okay, we're on the agenda okay. item for this improvement. Excuse me, my mistake. Then I'll yeah. speak about this. Yeah. Uh, number two, um, and really uh, the reason I came down here tonight was uh, I go past this area every day probably several times. And one of the things I've always noticed is all of the picnic benches, which are set up on the other side of the restaurant. And in my quest for revenues for the city of Newport, it's always been curious to me whether or not that property is leased or paid for in any way. And as silly as that sounds, I think it speaks to what we're talking about here to some degree about potentially what happens in the future and the commercial use of the property. Because I think the last thing that area needs is more congestion on the weekends with people running across with their meals. Um, and I, at one point, I think there was some waitress or waiter service there. And I've always sort of curious, is the city getting paid for those picnic tables? That's number one. Number two, I think you should consider the additional traffic because the 15th Street area has become a meeting place for certain groups, which I think the community supports. But this just might really intensify the use in that area. And if you are going to have uh, heavy construction, which will only be temporary, I think that the applicant should be uh, held to very stringent guidelines if they are thinking about building uh, there and also perhaps on the weekend, as this gentleman suggests. So that's all I'd like to contribute this evening. Okay. Oh, no, that's interesting. In this picture, there are picnic tables. Is that? Um... Yeah, I, I walk by there too. I, I don't know that they're for the exclusive use of the stuffed surfer, so I've never looked at them as, as something that would be subject to an encroachment permit and a payment. To my okay. understanding, there's no Because I know the that the, we, had the table, sales tax. we had the tables at, the, at Big Corona, yeah. uh, the, food, the Fuji Grill, but anybody could sit at right. them. You, I'm That's sure the proprietor hoped they wouldn't, but, yeah. but they could. Okay. Okay. Any other comments? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to council. Oh, that's right. Uh, Joe, uh, did you want to make any further comments? Uh, just um, very briefly and, and just really one, one comment. The question is whether or not we intend to demolish the existing commercial buildings. We have no intention of demolishing the existing commercial buildings. We will modify them only as much as we have intended thus far. We really have planned on minimal demolition to the, to the existing buildings. You would like to keep them as much in operation. And there is no expansion because if we attempted to expand them, we would be in violation of the bylaw. We would have issues related to additional parking. The issue is to maintain the buildings and to improve the exterior look of them um, because they like it to have a good looking project we're done. And I have built numerous buildings at that price, just finished a 9,000 square foot house at that 159 square foot, and as the contractor as well, so I can wear both hats. And I've built a five story building over top of a 120 year old story building, and it's still standing and it's quite happy. So happy to answer any other questions. Um. If these buildings are as old as they are, have they had any seismic retrofits over they've, the course of the years? Um, to the best of my knowledge, there have been no seismic retrofits. There's been no cracking. There's no, there's no structural issues related to the existing buildings. They're really sound existing buildings. I mean, it's just sort of the reality. Like, the, like the, uh, the bell tower at, at Harbor High School. It was such a seismic problem they had to take it down. It took, I forget how many blows of, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of the I mean, wrecking ball to bring it down. <laughs> it yeah. just didn't want to come down. This is, this is, you know, an existing residential building. It's light frame construction that's going over top of it. It's not a heavy structure that's going over top of it. So that's part of, what, part of what's going on. So I've got a question. Uh, you, you spoke about you know, the $159 a square foot. Can you give us more information on how you arrived at that and then the uh, comment that was made on the differential between that and the commercial res construction, residential which you estimated at $364 a square foot? The residential was based on current construction work that I've just completed in the last 12 months in a house in Ocean Ranch in Laguna, Laguna Niguel. In fact, our cost was less than that, and this was an increase because it's down in Newport, it's on the beach, and it's on a hard access site. 
Um, the commercial costs were higher because they included if we, ha if we had to demolish the existing commercial buildings, rebuild them according to com current commercial codes with uh, automated sprinkler systems, mechanical systems that were related, the commercial costs will just simply be higher than they are for residential. You know, it's just a fact of life. It's a higher, higher structure building and it was cost of replacing, replacing that structure. Okay, thanks. I have a question for okay. staff. Go ahead. Um, on the non-conforming structures from the former code, it says the language is both basically the same for structural alterations and additions. Alteration of up to 75% of the structural elements within any 12-month period. So does that mean that they do, they go in there and they go, ah, oh, we really got to do a lot, but they can come back the next in, next year if they don't finish and get more? I mean, how, how is that controlled? That might be the case if we didn't have a code change in the middle of this. So if once if this project were approved and built, they would be limited to the, the 75 square or 75 percent. Any new projects, the new code would be applicable, which limits it to 50 percent for a 10-year period. But they can come back in a year and get the 50 percent. So if they if they did encounter the problems that that, that we were anticipated, so they get in there. That's been one of the concerns, is that they get in there and they go, oh, wow, it's not 75 percent, it's 85 percent because of all these things. And first of all, in that case, it takes a lot of gall for us to go, well, too bad. <laughs> you're, you're, you lose, buck week. But even if we did, um, then they could just wait a couple months and then come back in and say, okay, this is what we need and go 50 percent. Well, the current code, the 50 percent is for addition. Structure alterations are not limited in the new code. Oh, could, so they can. Yeah, they could do foundation, no all structural. Limit, yeah, they okay. can do. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Council Member Selich. Well, 1997 is coming back to me. <laughs> you know, I was thinking a little earlier, you've been hanging around too long because now you're having to deal with your own mistakes. <laughs> That's true. You know, the reason that we did the staged approach was that um, just because of the point that you brought up, if you went and did 25% which is where we originally started on this thing, then you could come in over the course of three years and remodel 75%. So we created a hierarchy of, uh, of more restrictive permits to get you to the 75% level, but the intent, and I'm not saying this is how, the, how it was practiced, but the intent when we wrote these things was that the maximum alteration would be 75%, that you couldn't do 75% and then come back and start over with 25%. And I presume that's how staff will interpret this. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you for that clarification. I think that's the first one we've had this evening on this side. <laughs> All right. Oh. Council Member the, Hill. The expansion of the residence, the new residence, uh, what's the square footage of that? Two hundred two thousand six hundred sixty eight square feet is the proposed addition. Yes, above the commercial is twenty three zero five, but the existing residential is proposed to be expanded by one thousand two hundred and thirty five square feet on the second floor. And then the garage is actually getting smaller with the addition of the carports. And they're two separate residents. So none of this triggers the new fire code then for sprinkling? It might, yes. Even though this is being, this would be constructed under the previous zoning code, the new building codes would be applicable. Applicable. And was, at least in my memory of going through those new fire codes, we talked about residents. I don't remember talking about mixed use. So how does the square footage below? I mean, if you're remodeling to 75%, doesn't that trigger that square footage into it as well? And so wouldn't you have to now sprinkle the entire complex, if you will? I believe it's a condition of approval that we got from when Fire and Building reviewed the application. Let me find that. Yes. It, yeah. The answer is yes, and whatever modifications are made, it will have to comply with today's code. Okay. Any more questions? All right. Do we have a motion? 
I'll offer. Well, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I'll offer a motion. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to move approval based upon the uh, staff's recommendations here. Um, uh, approval of the project. And I, I guess I just offer these thoughts. Um, we've actually had it confirmed by both the applicant and the opponent that it can be engineered correctly and it can be built to the correct engineering standards for the foundation, although it might be harder and a little more expensive uh, and you have to be a little more careful. The trash enclosure is going to be enclosed, um, so that objection sort of goes away and I'm glad for that, although I think that it is true that that trash enclosure actually is beneficial to the limiting the trash in the area because everybody runs along there and throws trash in it. That won't happen anymore. I hope it doesn't end up on the street. Um, but in any event, it's better that the trash enclosure be enclosed. And as to the parking, um, I, we've heard it said now several times, the commercial area will not be expanded. And uh, if anybody feels like we need to alter the resolutions to make that so abundantly clear that it cannot be refuted, I'd be happy to do that. But I, I, from what I've heard, that's not necessary. So um, as far as I'm concerned, the main objections that have been raised have been dealt with. I'm certainly not in a position to counter the engineering judgments uh, that have been made here. And uh, I didn't hear uh, the opponents bring an engineer up here to counter that. And so as far as I'm concerned, uh, we should allow the project to go forward, and I'll make that motion. Second. So, uh, could I Council just or Mayor make Pro Tem a, a note that uh, in the final approval that there's going to be staff is going to follow up on condition number 22 to see if there has been a change in what the utilities department wants in terms of sewer laterals. If I may, we can just remove that condition, and if it is a requirement, then we'll implement it at plan check whether or not it's a condition or not. Okay. Is there any other comment from council? Please vote. Prior to reading the vote, I will read the title for resolution number 2011-90, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach reversing the decision of the Planning Commission and approving use permit number UP2010-021 and modification permit number MD2010-027 for an addition and alterations to a non-conforming structure that will encroach, encroach into the side and rear setbacks located at 10115 Street. With council members Hill and Rosansky voting no, the motion carries. Okay. Um, yeah, I do, uh, I do hope this is the last one of these that we're going to have to see. This I hope a, I never see 1997 again. Yeah, this was a whole lot of brain damage tonight. Okay. I move the next item. <laughs> and, and, uh, Mr. Mr. Mayor, it would be interesting if um, there's anyone in the audience to speak on the next item. We could certainly do this. I, Mr. Rosansky may have some questions you want to No, I'm just going to recuse myself okay. as I do rent there we go. property within uh, <laughs> 500 feet of this project. Okay, do we have a staff report? A brief one? Yes, I have a brief PowerPoint if you, if you desire. Well, do... Do we feel compared to Hill, uh, compelled to hear a staff report I thought on that this? the, the written staff report was excellent and very informative. Certainly answered all my questions. Thank you. So I guess we don't need a staff report. Okay. Does uh, council have any questions regarding this project that they'd like to ask? Now? No, I just thought it was interesting that of all of the uh, applications we've gotten, this is really the first one that has gone this direction instead of asking for additional res residential or mixed use or something. Very interesting. Uh, but I, I move the action. Second. All right, we have a message, um, a motion, and a second. Is there a public comment on this item? Seeing none, bring it back. Any further discussion, please vote. 
Let's read the titles first. Resolution number 2011-91, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach approving amendment to the land use element of the general plan to change the land use designation from multi-unit residential to general industrial for property located at 1537 Monrovia Avenue. Resolution number 2011-92, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Newport Beach approving amendment to the land use element of the general plan to change the land use designation from multi-unit residential to general industrial for property located at 1539 Monrovia Avenue and ordinance number 2011-23 for introduction and ordinance of the City Council of City of Newport Beach approving zoning code amendment to change the zoning designation of properties located at 1537 and 1539 Monrovia Avenue with that with council member Rosansky recusing himself the motion carries 6-0 okay Steve you can come back in now um, item number 24 Block grant. I'm assuming we have a brief staff report. Mayor Han, we have a very brief staff report. This is just the annual reporting requirement, uh, requirement that we need to proceed with in conformance with our receipt of the community development block grant funds. We have our consultant in the audience um, this evening, Clint Whited, with LDM Associates, who can answer any questions of council. I was just, just pleased to see that we seem to be keeping our administrative costs within what nonprofits try to, to maintain, and, and that's, that's nice. I missed that. What was that? Just to keeping our administrative costs down. Okay. Are we done with the staff report? We are. Um, I have a question for you. Uh, what's on the horizon with uh, federal block grants? Um, any uh, project, uh, predictions? Uh, the latest that we've heard from like community development organizations is uh, they expect level funding for CDBG or something close to it and another cut to the home uh, investment partnerships program which Newport Beach doesn't receive. So we're looking for uh, something similar to what you approved for 2011. We're hoping for it. I would move the item. Second. All right, motion and a second. We do need public comment. Is there anyone that wishes to comment on this item? Seeing none, back to council. Uh, please vote. With council member Rosansky absent, the motion carries. Okay. Council member uh, Rosansky was finishing off the cookies a minute ago, and so I'm assuming he'll be here shortly. There were none left. <laughs> there what? There were none left. Oh. Well, he was eating something in there a minute ago. So, all right. <laughs> all right. So, put, put it back together here. Item number 25. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, this item is a request to, uh, to construct non-standard uh, private improvements in the public right-of-way at uh, 3431 Ocean Boulevard uh, via an encroachment permit and agreement. Um, as you may recall, this property has been around. Uh, it was first uh, presented to you back in 2006 um, with some rather extensive requests for some encroachments. I think what uh, the applicant is proposing uh, at this time is, 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 is fairly reasonable. Um, we've, we've met with them. We've tried to uh, uh, minimize the amount of encroachment into the public right-of-way. As you may recall, this is uh, one of the properties on, on uh, Ocean that has that uses a shared driveway that's kind of a loop coming down from Ocean Boulevard. And I apologize, I don't have an exhibit for you. Um, the exhibits we have didn't really make a very good pr projection, but um, there's, there are exhibits in the report, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about those. But uh, I guess, in essence, the reason why we're here tonight is because L6 requires you to approve this. I, I don't have the authority to approve this, but I think we, as staff, we recommend that you do approve this. What is included are some uh, non-standard improvements in the way of uh, textured paving, uh, redoing a retaining wall, an existing retaining wall. Um, the applicant also would like to straighten out a kink that's in the existing retaining wall, and I think we're in agreement with that as long as the resultant wall is placed so there's no net increase or, or a net loss of public area. Uh, I think that would be a fair way to go, and it's a rather minor adjustment, really, in the existing wall alignment. Um, 
In addition, there's also some uh, transformers and uh, uh, gas meters and things that have to be in the public right of way as a result of the, the house with the reduced uh, setback uh, in, that, in that location. So we're, we don't have any really big issues about it, and uh, we would recommend that you approve it. Just, just as a, I walked it, and I was concerned when I first read it. I thought, well, it was up on the walkway, and we were going to take away from the public's walking area, and it's not at all. This is an area where occasionally people will jog down that path, or t but mm. it's, not a, it's not a thoroughfare. So I, I don't think that we're impinging at all upon the public's enjoyment of, of Ocean Boulevard and the views and everything. And I should also add that the applicant is willing to re-landscape a good portion of that slope and, and take on the maintenance of it, which is, a, which is, I think, a good benefit to the city. Okay. Council Member Selich. Uh, as Yogi Berra said, it's deja vu all over again. We spent a lot of time on this a few years ago. So have all the objections we had before rem removed in your new recommendation there? Yes, I, I think... Uh, the, the proposal now is less intense than, than originally proposed back in 2006, and I, I think what's being asked for is reasonable and appropriate. Okay. Any other questions of staff? All right. Is there any member of the public that wishes to comment on this item? Good evening. My name is Lawrence Tabak. I'm the property owner. Um, thank you for considering this application. Um, the, uh, the only one thing that the staff put in the report is that there, the wall should be moved forward so that there's no net gain for me of public, mm -hmm. public land. And I'm, I'm totally okay with that, but I just want to make it clear that um, there was a garbage receptacle or a little hut that was constructed and that's actually what caused this kink in the wall mm -hmm. and this was maybe constructed 50 60 years ago with the original house it was built out of the same materials as the house it had a little roof on it and it was basically for the exclusive use of the homeowner who who built the uh, built that structure many years ago so we demolished that and essentially gave up the uh, the, the use of that land and now when we straighten out the kink in the wall we, by doing that, we will actually be taking some of the public land by straightening the wall, but we gave up e e e what I would consider equal amount of land, which is maybe a, an area of seven feet by seven feet or something like that. So it's kind of a wash, and I just want to make sure that, you know, that we're all on the same page about that, or unless, you know, you guys have some issue with that. Well, I, I think we're looking at it from what's existing out there today is the wall, and I think uh, what we're really talking about is uh, uh, probably inches and in taking, you know, moving that wall a little closer, just so there's no net increase in in usable area. Well, um, there's an existing piece of wall that runs parallel to ocean. Mm -hmm. We want to leave that alone and just straighten the adjacent piece so that it all lines up in mm -hmm. one line. That's kind of would give it the nicest look, and I just want to make sure that mm -hmm. that's, we're all on the same page, that that's what we're doing, or, unless you don't agree with that. Well, I think, I think what we were thinking along the lines that you might reconstruct that portion, that small portion of wall, and essentially, so there's no net increase in area in, in that. I, I understand what you're saying about the trash enclosure, but the trash enclosure wasn't really a legitimate improvement in the public right of way initially. Uh, it was essentially a non-conforming use. Um, we're just trying to make sure that we're not intensifying any of the use in the public right of way. Right. So I think that maybe we could sit down with you and kind of come to some agreement. Okay. And I think we can work it through. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'm all for that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, move Is the action. Other? I'm sorry? I'm just going to move the action. I'll I'll all right. Motion from Mayor Pro Tem Gardner. Second, uh, Council Member Selich. Do we have any public comment on this issue? Other public comment, I should say. Rush, did you have anything else? I was just going to acknowledge that I walked the property today, and, and I think when it's all done, no one will ever know anything was done. Uh, by the terrain of the proper property, uh, even when you're walking down this existing driveway, you'll never see what's done. And with it re-landscaped, I, I have absolutely no issue with it whatsoever. 
All right, any further comment? Please vote. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, item 26, Marina Park. Good evening, Council, Council members. Um, happy to bring this to you. This is actually the conclusion of a long effort with the state lands. This is the actual boundary agreement we'd like you to go ahead and approve and, and start the execution of. This boundary agreement basically removes some portions per the exhibits in here out of the Tidelands Trust, uh, particularly the community center, the Girl Scout house, the tennis courts, and it moves some other areas into the Tidelands Trust. It'll terminate into a 49-year uh, lease and that will be followed up with legislation that state land staff will be uh, processing to take that area that now goes to the state in their trust and moves it back into the city of Newport as the trustee over the area. So that's basically the report. If you'd like any specifics, happy to talk. Any uh, item? Oops, Council nope. Member Curry. I have no questions. I'm I sorry? Will. I have no questions. I'll just move the item. Second. Oh. Okay, there's a motion. Um, I would just note uh, nice work by staff. Took a long time, so good job. Many yeah. people, particularly Leonie Mulvihill, did a lot, great job on this. Others, thank you. Yeah, good job, Dave. Mayor Pro Tem Gardner? Mm, I'll start. Oh, all right. Well, um, you're too modest, Dave. I think your contributions were significant to this, too, uh, you and Leonie both. And so um, this was really a terrific outcome, and I'm very, very appreciative of the work that's been done here. It was a real struggle. On to Coastal. Do we have any public comment on this item? Yes, Mayor Hen and members of the council. My name is Jim Mosher. As you know, I've been curious about this item for quite some time, and I share the uh, Deputy Public Works Director's happiness that the settlement has finally been reached. And even though it seems to involve a promise that the state land property will eventually be added to that, but the city holds in trust, it does, as had been promised, involve a lease, at least temporarily, uh, which would be the justification for the many closed sessions that have held, been held about it. But the justification for those has to be something involving the cost of the lease. And uh, there may be other members of the public <coughs> other than me wondering what the cost of the lease that was finally arrived at and uh, looking through this, I found the actual lease that you're agreeing to tonight, starting on page 34. And I read here under, on page 35, it says, the consideration will be the public use and benefit subject to the modification by the lease or, that's the State Lands Commission, I believe, as specified in paragraph two of section four, which are the general provisions of the lease. And I flip through a few more pages to section four. I don't ever quite know if I'm looking at the same things that you're looking at, but page 39 in my copy of the general provisions that might affect that is blank. It says to be inserted, so I'm, I'm still in the dark as to whether the uh, city is promising to pay the State Lands Commission uh, for this lease until the uh, thing is resolved as, as making it trust land held by the city. Thank you. Okay, any other comments? Seeing none, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion carries unanimously. All right, that was the uh, last item of business. Uh, motions for reconsideration. A motion to reconsider the vote on any action taken by the City Council at either this meeting or the previous meeting may be made only by one of the Council members who voted with the prevailing side. Seeing no motions for reconsideration, Council Member uh, or Mayor Pro Tem Gardner has asked that we close the meeting in memoriam. I would like it to be closed in memory of Jerry Mello. Uh, those of you uh, have read about it in the paper at least, uh, the Council Member from Fort Bragg who stumbled upon a, uh, either a marijuana or an opium farm and was shot and killed. And I happened to know him. I, I had an opportunity to work with him a couple of, at a couple of meetings of the Coastal Issues uh, Committee of the League. And even knowing him just a couple of times, I can tell you he was really a wonderful person. He was that kind of person that uh, you're new to a group, he makes you feel like they've been waiting for you and your contribution for as long as he could remember. He took a leadership position with Coastal Issues. We, we owe him a lot for his activities. 
and it's just um, it's such a shame that someone who had contributed so much to his community and to the state um, was killed like that. And I, if I can editorialize, I think that, that even the casual drug user must remember that um, they contribute to actions like this when, when, they, when they buy drugs. So, um, but he was a, a wonderful person, and uh, I, I would like us to remember him. Very good. Thank you. We are adjourned.